you so much for joining us. You're watching continuing coverage of the World Health Care Congress here from Washington, D.C. We have had a, a great number of interviews this morning, and we look forward to speaking with Len Nichols, who is director of the Center for Health Policy Research and Ethics and professor of health policy at George Mason University. And also, he was former senior advisor for health policy during the Clinton administration. Hey there, Len. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Very, very well. And you'll be addressing some very big issues, questions during your next panel later on today. Uh, you do come from a lot of very interesting experience when it comes to health care, having been one of the advisors during the Clinton administration. And you had mentioned that the basis of that particular health care reform package is the basis of what we saw in the Obamacare Well, package. what came out of the Clinton experience was a learning that we all learned painfully, but it's really true. You want something to work in this country, it's got to be bipartisan. Clinton wasn't able to get bipartisan support, but during that time, there was a lot of back and forth where different Republicans proposed concrete, comprehensive alternatives to the specific Clinton plan. That Chafee Dole piece of legislation, which had 18 Republican co-sponsors, including Orrin Hatch and mm -hmm. Chuck Grassley, mm -hmm. is the core of what Romney Care and Obamacare became. Individual right. mandate, reorganize the individual and small group markets, do Medicare savings and, and tax cap to pay for it. Right. And let's all agree, we're in this together. We're going to make this work. We're going to make it affordable for our country and for families. Mm -hmm. And we can do this through private insurance. Right. That's exactly where Max Baucus started in 2009. Wow. What became different was the Republicans in 2009 had moved a long way from where some of those same Republicans were in 1993. And Baucus found he couldn't reach consensus. But Chuck Grassley did work with him throughout the summer of 2009. It was only when the town halls, when, when everybody went home for the August recess, that's when Grassley peeled off of okay. support for the, uh, for the Affordable Care Act. Okay. So with all of that in mind, how much of that will survive the current administration's moves to, um, to repeal and replace? So I think we need to think about this as a long chess game. This is not a simple yin and yang. We're going to finish this this afternoon. What Trump really wants is a victory. He doesn't care what it looks like. He just wants a victory where he can say the House voted to repeal Obamacare. Then let the Senate, if you will, fix it. And fixing it will probably move it back toward the middle, which is where the Senate always ends up. But that will probably cost the Republicans the support of the Freedom Caucus in the House. Mm -hmm. So that means ultimately they're going to have to have Democratic votes, probably in the Senate and the House, before they get this all done. In a funny way, that might end up, it could end up being somewhat close to what President Clinton would have done had she won because she would have needed Republican votes in the same way. Mm -hmm. So it's possible we could get to a solution that moderate Republicans, moderate Democrats could actually be comfortable with. We won't call it Obamacare, we'll okay. call it something else, sure. but that's okay. okay. The problem right now is the Republicans are trapped trying to do it all by themselves in the House and they don't have a majority for any given model. And that's why the moderates re objected to the AHCA as it was written. The Freedom Caucus obviously didn't like it as written. Mm -hmm. They did something to try to make the Freedom Caucus happy, which makes the moderates unhappy. So they're having a difficult time getting that political thing done. Okay. Healthcare's hard. Oh, it is hard. And the and president I'm learned that, and I'm proud of him for saying that. You know, it's the only issue <laughs> he's admitted was more complicated than he thought. And you're right on board. You like what he said. He, you agree. I he like said. the fact he agreed yeah. it's complicated. I yeah. wish he'd read a little <laughs> bit more. But anyway, we'll worry about that. I, I think the bottom line, though, is we have to come to an agreement in our country. We are yeah. going to make this affordable for all people, or not. Right? right, the Obamacare attempt was to make it affordable for all people. The Republicans don't like certain features of it. I don't like certain features of it. Let's work together to fix those. And that's what moderates are talking about doing in the Senate as we speak. Well, in the interim, do states like my own, Ma mm. the state of Massachusetts, which has Romney Care, mm -hmm. and which was the basis of the Affordable Care Act, they tried to replicate it in some form. That's correct. Will it matter to states like that that have their own system in place? Um, 
what happens in Washington, Yes, because as cute as Massachusetts is, you're doing it with a lot of federal money. Okay. And those federal dollars at the moment flow from a set of legislation that is mirroring what Romney proposed, but it is federal legislation. If the current version in the House becomes law and we cut Medicaid spending by $800 billion or whatever it is, and we cut the subsidies that are being given to people buying in the individual market, then Romney Care will have a much harder time sure. continuing. So what you would like, I would think, would be something more like what Senator Cassidy and Senators Cassidy and Collins, Cassidy from Louisiana, Collins from Maine, that's about as different as you can yes. get in lots of ways, mm -hmm. to Republicans in the Senate. They've proposed, if a state wants to keep Obamacare, let them keep it. Okay. They want to change it, let them change it, and let's talk about that. Right. And that seems to me to be something that could it, end up being a compromise. It actually sounds very reasonable. Oh, how about that? Up. It is possible. Yes, yeah. those people live in the Senate. They don't live in the House. Okay. <laughs> now, what about what's going on outside of all of this? You see a lot of partnerships that are developing between employers and providers who say, we're just going to go out there and try to just do this on our own. We're going to cut out the middleman. We're going to go directly to providers, come up with some sort of partnership, pay for it. Everyone's happy. Well, you know, what's really fascinating about the way our conversation has changed since the Clinton time to now, okay, back in the 90s, it was really all about coverage. But the fear was cost could become unaffordable. Now costs are uh, unaffordable. Sure. So those predictions of failure turned out to be true, and people are getting increasingly desperate. The good thing about the Affordable Care Act's promise, if you will, we're going to cover everybody, and therefore we have to become more efficient. That signal got sent throughout the delivery system, and the employer community was already there. The delivery system, though, is, very, is reacting very differently now than they did in the 90s. Okay. Now they're actually taking a bit in their teeth and saying, okay, what can we do to make this more efficient? Okay, okay. And that's what's that's different. That's good. That, oh, right? totally good, totally good. That's what's different. The, the people who run the healthcare system now get that they've got to become more efficient and deliver higher value. Employers are demanding it, government's demanding it, everybody's demanding it, the people are demanding it. Okay. So that's, that's all to the good. And what's kind of difficult about trying to just erase Obamacare, a lot of those good ideas of changing incentives and aligning incentives across payers and providers, they're already out there. Why would you want to go back to the old world? Right. They're not all perfect, but a lot of what's going on is promising and is effective, and, and they are forming collaborations that are working. Okay, so should so should we just let all the tweeting and all the like the infighting with the Instagram and the tweeting, all of that, okay, happen in Washington while over here, those partnerships that you say are good are happening and there may be more of them. So perhaps we don't have to worry about as that much about well if all if Washington Obama did was Care tweet and right. leave the law alone it would be okay but that's that's not what's at stake here <laughs> right. right what's at stake is they want to re they want to replace it for the purpose of, re of repealing it and and the question is what will be left in place if they leave it alone then I think the system could take care of itself they, we need some tweaks let's okay. be clear but you would, Washington could make it worse or yeah. they could make it better but I would vote for making it better and to me making yeah. it better first of all is bipartisan but he wants a win he wants a win and he doesn't care how, and yeah. so he wants a win. And I think he, the way he talks, and Lord knows you can pick up a different day and get a different impression, but I would say on average, what he says is, I want everybody to be covered and I want pre-existing condition people to be covered. It's just that that's not what's in the House bill right now. I think he thinks that's what'll come out of the Senate. I think he would be comfortable having a bipartisan. He's almost apolitical in the sense of party. He doesn't care about that. What he cares about is, I think, looking good to the people who supported him. And he promised the people who supported him, a lot of whom, by the way, benefit from Obamacare, he promised them they would get something at least as good, if not better. So taking it away is not going to make them happy and therefore won't make him happy. So we got to do more than tweet. We got to make sure we don't screw it up. And we got to, in, in many ways, improve, I would say, the conditions of the collaboration. One big problem we have right now, to do all the new payment reform and all the incentive realignment, we need data. Mm -hmm. We need a data sure. infrastructure that we do not have. We sort of thought it was going to magically arise when we pushed money out the door and encouraged providers to buy electronic health records. And electronic health records are on balance good things, but those electronic health record systems do not work 
for clinicians to do what they thought they could do to manage population health. Right. The notion that doctors are going to stay up all night writing software programs to push reports out there is crazy. We got to pull the data out of those machines, reduce the burden on physicians, and make it possible for data to flow in a way where payers and clinicians and patients can all see them in real time. Yeah. It's actually happening in some parts of our country, mm -hmm. which is what makes me believe we can fix this. You know, something Bill Clinton used to love to say, there's nothing wrong with America. That's what right with America can't fix. So let's go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you will see a uh, health information exchange, which takes the data from the doctor's offices. The docs don't have to do anything extra to get this stuff to flow. They generate data analytics, reports back, dashboard form, back to the doc every morning. You got three diabetics coming in today, two of which have not had a hemoglobin A1C in three years. Yep. Be sure you do that test. That is aiding clinical care yep. at the patient level, but it's at the population level because you're managing to the conditions you know that really matter. That can be done everywhere. We just aren't smart enough to do it yet. <laughs> but it sounds like we're headed in the right oh, direction. Oh, we could be. Thank if, you. Yes. 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 Len, could I ask you, how, how are you enjoying the World Healthcare Congress this well, year? Well, you know, the Congress is always inspirational because it shows you all the different things that are going on that make sense and some things that don't make sense, yeah. and, and so you get a range of views. So I love to come and just kind of absorb. All right, Len, and we'd love to have you. Thank you so much. That's great. And thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned. A few more interviews to come.